since you are the expert on this, can you give us a real breakdown of what the difference is between a solar eclipse and an annular eclipse? Because, you know, we, I don't know if everyone really knows that there is a, a total difference for the two. Right. So in both a total solar eclipse and an annular solar eclipse, the moon passes directly in front of the sun, at least as seen from the special spots on Earth where that path is, okay. is, 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 is passing. So the thing, the difference is, that the moon's orbit around the Earth is not perfectly circular. It's elliptical, and that means that at some points in its orbit, it's further from the Earth, and at other points, it's, it's closer. It just so happens, by an amazing cosmic coincidence, that when the moon is closer to the Earth, it is big enough to almost exactly cover the sun, and when it's a little further away from us, it's just not quite big enough to cover the sun. So an annular eclipse is kind of a failed total eclipse when the moon passes directly in front of the sun, but it's just a little smaller than the solar disk. And so if you're standing at the center of that path, you'll see what's sometimes called a ring of fire mm -hmm. where the sun is, is uh, left uh, behind the moon. All right. Um, and you say that this cosmic occurrence, I mean, talk more about how you use science, you use physics, or how you are able to project when we are going to have this kind of event. So one of the fascinating things about eclipses is that they can be predicted with great accuracy decades, centuries, even millennia in advance or, you know, in the past. So that's because the orbits of the moon and the rotation of the Earth are all very precisely known. But even ancient people spotted some of the patterns that underlie the motion of the, the, the moon and the Earth and were able to work out some patterns and make predictions about eclipses. Babylonians thousands and thousands of years ago noticed that eclipses recur with a certain pattern every roughly 18 years and 11 days. And they gave a name to this and, and were able to predict you know, that, that pattern of occurrences. So if my memory serves me correctly, which it can be some, sometimes foggy, 2017 we had an eclipse. Mm -hmm. Was that solar or annular? That was a total solar eclipse. Okay, mm -hmm. so folks I'm sure can think back to that and remember the, just the craze of trying to find like the special glasses to wear. Mm -hmm. And um, so how can we safely take in an event like this? So eclipses are a really beautiful thing to watch and experience and it's important to keep in mind safety precautions when, when doing so. Throughout, it is, first, it is never safe to look directly at the sun without eye protection, whether during an eclipse or not. So during the partial phases of the eclipse, you have to look at the sun wearing a pair of special eclipse glasses, which are like very, very, very dark sunglasses. They're so dark that you really can't see anything through them except the sun. If you can see your surroundings, they're probably not good enough to be eclipse glasses. So you can safely observe all the partial phases of the eclipse, or for that matter, look at the sun at any other day with a pair of these eclipse glasses. If you don't happen to have eclipse glasses, and you know, they're cheap, they cost a couple of bucks, they're widely available, be sure to buy them from a reputable vendor. Um, but if you don't have a pair of eclipse glasses, you can also safely observe the partial phases of the eclipse through some kind of a, a pinhole projector. A piece of paper with a little round hole in it, like a piece of notebook paper, will work just fine for that. It will project that image of the partially eclipsed sun onto the floor or a wall. Even a kitchen colander will work great for that. You'll see this repeated pattern of all these little crescent suns. The special thing about totality is that during those few minutes of the total eclipse when the moon is completely covering the sun, you can take your glasses off, you can look directly at the sun, and you'll see that beautiful solar corona, that delicate, almost like silky looking atmosphere of the sun that is there all the time, but it's not visible under ordinary conditions because the sun's light is so bright it, it blocks it out. That side of the corona is what people really find incredibly moving about an eclipse. It's such a beautiful sight. The sky will be dark. You can see bright stars. You can see planets. Venus and Jupiter and Mars and Saturn should be visible. Um, on April 8th when, when the sun is in eclipse. So when you say it's going to be completely dark, I mean, are we talking midnight kind of dark or more dawn, dusk? I mean, what can we visually expect? It's not deep nighttime darkness, but it'll be about as dark in the path of totality. It will be about as dark as it gets maybe like 45 minutes after sunset. The difference is after sunset, you see twilight colors only in the west. But during a total eclipse, you see the colors of twilight 360 degrees around the horizon 
as we're standing in the center of the moon's shadow and, and the region uh, outside of that is, is uh, still in light. How long does totality last in whatever given point you're at? It, every eclipse is different. Okay. And, and for our eclipse, um, the maximum duration of totality is around four minutes. It depends on exactly where you are. The closer you are to the center line, that center of the path, then the eclipse will last the longest. In our area, it lasts right around four minutes. As you move further away from the center line, the duration of totality starts to drop. And at the edge of that path, it can be only, it can be only seconds. Michigan gets a little bit of that path of totality. We have a tiny slice of very far southeast Michigan, roughly up our Lake Erie Lakeshore, about as far north as Luna Pier. That's quite far from the center line. And so at Luna Pier, the duration of totality is only about 15 seconds. If you can get closer to the center line, that's where you should go. All right, interesting. Um, so going back where you said, um, did you say every about 17 years when you were talking about the different eclipses? 18 years. 18 years. Um, so obviously we didn't have 18 years between this last solar eclipse and mm -hmm. this eclipse. It was a little short, er, shorter together. Mm -hmm. When is our anticipated next solar eclipse from you know this one? So solar eclipses seem rare because they happen so infrequently in any one place. If you stand in any one place on Earth and wait for a solar eclipse, you wait on average 380 years between total eclipses. So that's why we're so fortunate right now to be living within driving distance of a total eclipse here in southeast Michigan. But total eclipses actually aren't that rare. They happen somewhere in the world about every one to three years. The thing is, though, that that path of totality is very narrow. It's only about 100 miles wide. And if you're outside of that path, you don't see totality. And another problem, of course, is that much of the Earth's surface is covered with water. And so that's especially hard to get to. So you have to usually travel somewhere to go. That path of totality only covers about half of 1% of the Earth's surface. So in general, to see a total eclipse, you have to go somewhere. The last solar eclipse that was visible from Michigan happened in the 1950s. The next eclipse that will be visible from a good swath of the continental United States won't happen until the year 2045, 21 years from now. And the next eclipse that's visible from Michigan won't happen until 2099. Wow. So take the chance to see this one while you can. A lot of talk has to do with the weather, of course, and projecting not only if we'll have rain, but just even the cloud cover. And a, a lot of times the lakes have an impact on the cloud cover, at least here you know, in Michigan. Um, so you know, with, with Cleveland being in that path of totality, talk a little bit more about what we were just mentioning just a few minutes ago about how, you know, what you've heard about for like Cleveland, for people that like, because that's driving distance for us, right? right? Like where you might have a better chance if we're planning this far out with the forecast right. where you could have some clear skies. Right. So because this eclipse is happening in early spring, we need to talk about weather. We all know what our Michigan weather can be like at this time of year. The path of this eclipse starts out over the Pacific and comes up through Mexico and Texas and then on through the central U.S. and, and into Ohio and, and um, New York and, and into Canada. Generally speaking for this eclipse, the further to the northeast you go, the greater the chance of clouds. Now that's a general statement based on historical patterns of, of climate, looking at this time of year over the past 20, 30 years, what is it, what is it like? Historically, in Ohio and Cleveland and Michigan, there's roughly a 60, 65% chance of clouds. Now, there's clouds and there's clouds. Of course, thin clouds are, are still great if you, can, if you can see the sun. And all you need is for it to be clear in that one patch of sky, so you never know. But um, generally speaking, the, the, the chance of cloud cover increases the further to the northeast you go. Now, that's all about climate, about history, about general trends. But now we're getting to be within 10 days, a week, of eclipse day and now we can actually start talking not about climate but about what you actually get on eclipse day which is weather and so we'll be counting on you Ashley <laughs> to tell us what the outlook is like and where to go um, to optimize our chances of getting that beautiful view that we uh, are so looking forward to. Well, I love that you know the difference between the climate and the weather. Uh -huh. <laughs> but speaking of the weather, I mean, uh, you know, totality with a solar eclipse can have an impact on the weather. We're not just talking about sky conditions. Mm -hmm. If you want to dive a little more into what occurs here at the surface for nature and, you know, even temperatures, what can happen when a, a solar mm -hmm. eclipse happens? One of the most fascinating things about the experience of 
being part of a solar eclipse is not just what's happening right there at the, at the sun in the sky, but what's happening all around us in our environment. As the light dims, as the sun approaches total eclipse, people on the ground will notice some changes in the environment. You'll notice that the temperature starts to drop. And as totality approaches, the temperature can drop 10 or 15 degrees. You will notice uh, sometimes that the wind picks up. Because of that sudden temperature drop, the, the air rushes in. You will notice uh, as we get really close to totality or, or in the minute or so before and during totality, animals will respond to the changes in light levels by entering their evening behaviors. Birds will start roosting. Insects, if we have any out in April, might start making their, their evening sounds. Uh, farm animals will return to the barn. It's really quite fascinating to see how nature responds to the onset of nighttime darkness whenever it happens. I wanted to go back to something we were talking about just a minute ago, where you had mentioned that, you know, really a solar eclipse is not as unusual. It's just the fact that to be in that same spot mm -hmm. is what makes it unusual. So in my business, we have storm chasers. Uh -huh. Are there solar eclipse chasers? Or if someone is deeply moved by this event and thinks, I want to experience this again, like how can we experience this outside of our, you know, little home here? One of the most amazing things about eclipses is the, the response people have to that experience, to the feeling of, of connectedness with nature, of that beautiful sight of the corona. And so one of the first things people often say after an eclipse, besides, imagine not knowing why this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> one of the other first things people say after an eclipse is, when and where is the next one? You might become an eclipse chaser, or what's sometimes called an umbrophile, a lover of shadow. And so people will, in general, you have to travel uh, around the world. The, the next total eclipse will happen in 2026, and it will be visible from um, off the coast of Iceland and off the coast of England, and it will finally make landfall near evening um, in Spain. So if you have been looking for an excuse to go to Spain, think about that in August of 2026. Uh, there are upcoming eclipses in Australia, upcoming eclipses in North Africa, for example, in the, in the next few years. If you, are, if you don't like to travel out of the country, you have to wait until 2024 to see a solar eclipse from the Pacific Northwest, or 2045 to see a coast-to-coast -coast eclipse across the US. All right. Now, I remember specifically being in third grade and there being some, I, I couldn't tell if it was a solar or annular, um, you know, total solar, solar eclipse or an annular eclipse, but I remember it going on outside the window of my classroom. Like, that's just a memory I have as an elementary mm -hmm. school student. Um, so there are going to be children that are experiencing this for the first time, and it's going to pique some kind of interest in them for science learning. And so having, you know, such a huge education background and your particular background, what can kids do after they see this to really delve into learning more about um, astronomy, our, you know, our solar system, just things like that. That's one of the most exciting things, too. I think, I think many of us experienced that in 2017 and wanted to learn more about the eclipse and, and caught the bug. I have a similar childhood experience to yours. I remember being six years old and watching a partial eclipse, and, and it spurred my interest to go see the last total eclipse in the US before the one in 2017, which was all the way in, in um, 1979, back in Canada, you know, I caught the bug and it's an important part of, of my own life story. I'm really excited about the fact that a lot of kids will be exposed to science, exposed to the beauty of nature through this event that is uh, special and, and rare. For people who want to learn more, for kids, there are a lot of great websites. I would start by going to NASA's webpage where there's explanations of eclipses for students of all levels, resources for teachers, uh, resources for parents and start exploring from there. One of the best parts about eclipses is that it's a great jumping off point for your own curiosity and your own exploration. We um, uh, have an event here at Michigan called Saturday Morning Physics um, that's public lectures and, and a couple of, uh, actually it was last January, we did, uh, we did a Saturday Morning Physics event live from the space station with uh, astronaut Josh Cassida who uh, has a Michigan connection. And uh, he told us, he's, a, he's a, a Navy pilot, and he told us he, he got a Navy plane in 2017 and flew along oh. the, the path. This, for this time around, I've heard that, that um, there's a couple of airlines, Delta and maybe Southwest and a few others have, have um, 
arrange special flights to kind of fly along the path. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a little gimmicky in the following sense. Um, it won't prolong the duration of totality that much. Well, that was going to be my next right, question because right. it's going to be, yeah, you're not going to be able to yeah. keep up with the pace of that. The, so, the, yeah. the moon's shadow in this eclipse is moving yeah. at around 1,600 miles per hour. It's, it's, it's much faster even than a, than a jet plane, and so it might add 30 seconds to totality. The other thing about this particular eclipse is that the sun will be kind of high in the sky when it happens about 55 or 60 degrees above the horizon. It's difficult to see something high in the sky out the window of an airplane. You know, you have to kind of crane your neck mm -hmm. and look. But I also think that when you're in an airplane, you are missing some of those wonderful environmental effects that we talked about. You won't feel the temperature drop. You won't feel the, the cool wind on your face. You won't see the changes in, in nature that, that are such an important part of that experience. Yeah, I guess the only trade-off is you know that you'd be above any cloud cover. You'll get you'll get clear skies. Right, but mm -hmm. also I wonder if they're only going to load one side of the plane. I mean, They've, you know, what if you have seats on both sides and it's not out it, your window? If you got an aisle seat, you're out of luck. <laughs> right, you're out, just out of luck. <laughs> when you mentioned the planets that we'll be able to see, I mean, is that with the naked eye or would that be with a telescope when that happens? Jupiter and Venus will be very conspicuously visible kind of to the left of the sun if you're looking from the ground uh, during during the eclipse. In fact, Venus is bright enough that I think within a half an hour plus or minus of totality you could be able to spot venus in the sky with your naked eye um, even then mars and saturn will be closely grouped off to the right of the sun they will be a little harder to spot but i think you can do it certainly with binoculars now you can see planets any night and i wouldn't waste a whole lot of time looking for planets if you have that view of the solar corona to enjoy, but know that they're there. And part of the feeling that one gets during an eclipse of, of connectedness to the cosmos, being part of this, this big, vast system, is that image of the sun with this string of planets together in mm -hmm. the daytime sky. Yeah. In Detroit, here in southeast Michigan, we're going to get, depending on where you are, like 98, 99. It's going it's to be really close. Okay, yeah, and I mean, like, so what does that I mean? Because that's a, a number that we throw out, but yeah, like, what can people expect? Do you notice a difference between 95 to 90% totality? Our eyes are really good at adjusting to changing light levels. So during the first half or two-thirds of the partial eclipse, you might not even really notice much in the way of, 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 a, of a dimming effect. It's only in the half an hour or so before totality or before a really deep partial eclipse that you start to notice uh, maybe colors are looking a little flatter. Shadows might start to look a little crisper because the light is not coming from this big wide disk anymore. It's coming from a, a thinner crescent. Um, and then in the moments before totality, it, the light levels drop a lot. But if you are outside the path, even close outside the path like we are in southeast Michigan, the remaining sunlight is still a lot of light. In Detroit, we're going to have a 99% partial eclipse. That is a 0% total eclipse. 1% of the sun's light, that remaining 1%, is about 400 times brighter than the full moon. It's a lot of light. It will cast shadows. The sky will be blue. It is not safe to look at the sun even, uh, even when it's 99% eclipsed. The difference between a 99% partial eclipse and a total eclipse is kind of like the difference between driving to Ford Field from some distance away and staying right outside the stadium. You got 99% of the way there. And then you hear the Lions win the game on the last play. The crowd goes nuts. You know something exciting happened. It was, you were close enough for it to be interesting, but it's nothing like the experience of being inside and watching it. Being 99% partial is the same kind of a thing. If you can get into that path of totality just an hour or so away from here, make the effort to do it. If you're a kid and you need a note from your astronomer to get out of school that day, call me up. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So, I mean, we talked about, you know, obviously the safety for your eyes and having those glasses, but before you're in totality when it's safe to take those glasses off and you're wanting to take pictures of the partial eclipse, mm -hmm. um, is it safe to do so even if you're wearing your glasses and you put your phone in front of your glasses or if you're using binoculars? I mean, how does that impact technology when we're not in totality? Right. So... Cameras and phones are, are kind of like our eyes. They need to be protected from direct sunlight when photographing the sun outside of totality. 
So during the partial phases, you can take pictures of that with a, with a camera phone or with a, with a regular camera by placing, for a, small, for a phone with a small lens, you could place eclipse glasses or something similar in front of the lens on the phone and safely take pictures of the sun with that. For a camera, you will need to put a, a larger solar filter over the front of the lens because that sunlight could damage the optics and the sensor in the camera if you let it through. If you're observing the eclipse with binoculars, it's important to remember that you must cover the front of the binoculars with a solar filter. It is not safe to hold the binoculars up to your eclipse glasses. You will be concentrating all that heat and all that light on those thin little pieces of film and that could melt your glasses and be unsafe. So any lens or binocular you treat as though it is your eyesight. Right, and you put the filter in front of it.